Okay, so welcome to the uh, third of our se sessions in our series, uh, Discipleship and the Biblical Understanding of What is uh, Discipleship. And we looked at why uh, discipleship works so much in our um, learning process. And so this final session, we're going to look at the actual templates of how we actually do discipleship. So uh, we have something that we call the flow. The flow is both the sessions, which I'm going to show you, and also the structure. Very simply put, uh, let me show you what this might look like. So uh, I'm the founding director of Pays, uh, and I obviously travel and I recruit essentially disciples, people who will join me in what I'm doing, and they will reproduce that work in others. So uh, this is a picture of me. And this is Junior. Uh, Junior came on pays and worked in the UK, and then eventually became the national director in Brazil. So I would um, do what I'm about to show you with Junior. I would disciple him and train him to do uh, what I do and how I do it. And he was the person I brought along. Then he would um, train some young leaders. Here's some young leaders that he trained. And then they would train uh, some of the young people in schools. So there was a flow. What I taught Junior, he passed on to the young leaders who passed them on to the students. So for instance, in this picture, uh, there's me at the beginning. I taught Junior how to uh, teach people Bible study using the Havarine method. He taught that to a load of young leaders. And eventually this young man who I met in Brazil uh, in his school, led a Bible study, reaching his school using the Havarim method. So we call that the flow, that's the structure. And in a different um, live wire, we'll explain how you structure discipleship in a church, how it works with leadership, how it works with a congregation. But what we're looking at right now is the session, actually how do you disciple someone? So um, the thing I want to talk about here is that um, this may at first feel a bit odd, the reality is discipleship, I don't think, is a part of church culture. Attending services, uh, breaking of bread, evangelism even, they're part of our culture, but I'm not sure discipleship is. So it may be a bit unworld, uh, kind of difficult to get, get in place at first, may be a bit, a bit awkward, may not be normal. But I wanted to point out the fact that apparently if you drive a manual car, uh, there are something like 44 steps to do that. But most of us are unconsciously competent. Um, there are 10 steps to what I'm about to show you. If you practice it on a regular basis, it will become just, you just, just won't even be aware you're doing it. Um, so, but what I do recommend is when you're learning this and when you're passing it on, you do it exactly the way we show you. Because it's a bit like a memory verse. You know, if you were to teach children a memory verse and you chose the same verse, but 10 different translations, it's going to take them a long time to remember them. But if you teach, pick one, translation that you know works or is accurate and you teach them that then they get to know it and then eventually they can you know they can add a label or bit and share it in different ways so initially i'm really recommending that what you do is you you grab hold of this in its purest sense practice it and eventually you can ad lib and change it around a little bit to suit your needs so the first thing we need to think about is preparation in advance prepare the principles and the practices that you want to teach now, I really want to emphasize something here. What we're not saying is that discipleship is experience instead of education. We're saying it's experience that leads to education. That people are more likely to be able to apply the education or even want to pull the education from you if you take them on an experience. So when you do this session, you still need to know exactly where you're taking people. What are the principles? What are the teachings that you want to pass on to them? You're not simply taking them on experience and then just answering questions. You still need some intentionality behind what you do. But we break discipleship into four steps. The first step is experience it. Take your disciple on an experience. Then ask them to write down the goal you have for the experience and ask them to write down what you do and what they do. So let's imagine you want to... Um, train someone in ministry. Let's take youth ministry. So let's say I'm a youth pastor. I'm training someone to be a youth pastor. I'm discipling them in that. And one of the things I want to do is to teach them how to recruit people to an event, how to engage people. Let's just imagine that's something because I think we're all familiar with that idea of getting people into a room. 
So first thing, we'll decide on a goal, and we'll say maybe we're going to try and get 100 young people who don't know Jesus to this event. And I'll say to them, before we do the experience, I want you to watch what I do, and I want you to watch what you do, and write down those things. And we're going to try all manner of different things to encourage people to come to this event. We're going to do posters, we're going to um, equip young people with flyers they can give to their friends, there's going to be social media group for the events, social media posts we can give to the young people, radio adverts, all these different things, and then we do the event. So I've prepared and we've taken them on an experience. We've advertised this and we've done the event, we've got young people to the event. Step two is then question it. Get your disciple to read out the goal and decide if it was met. Ask them to write down what was most effective in the left column and ask them to write down what was less effective in the right column. Ask them then to find a principle by asking the question, what do the things in the left column have in common that are not present in the right column? So again, what you remember is part of what we're trying to do is help people uh, understand why things work and why things don't work. So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, how did the event go? Our goal, what was our goal? And the person I'm discipling would say, we got 70 people. And I'd say, okay, great. What we don't want to do here is over-spiritualize things. You know, so we have this habit, don't we, of, of uh, over-spiritualizing. Uh, it's a little bit like the story of a, a father who takes a son to the forest and says, I'm going to teach you how to shoot an arrow. So he takes, the father, he takes his son to the forest, he takes a paint pot and he draws a target on a tree and he gives him a bow and arrow and he says, I want you to fire the arrow at the target and I'm going to go and make some sandwiches. And while he's making some sandwiches, the young boy fires the arrow, misses. Not only does he miss the target, he misses the tree. So what does he do? He gets a paint, he gets the paint pot and he goes and paints a target around the arrow on the tree that he actually hits. And we do that all the time, don't we? Well, we only got 70 people. Well, don't worry, it's just the 70 that Jesus wanted there. We spiritualize our failure or we spiritualize the things when we don't meet our targets. That's not helpful. In discipleship, it's not a problem if people fail. It's a discipleship learning moment. So first of all, what we do is we say, yeah, we only got 70 people. We hoped we had 100. Okay, what worked and what didn't work? Well, these things worked and these things didn't work. Okay, well, what do you notice in the things that worked that's a common factor? What principle do you find there? Oh, well, the things that worked were the things that were more relational. Okay, great. So there's a principle we've learned. That's what we do in stage two or step two. In step three, we understand it. We ask them to create a diagram, soundbite, or story to summarize their principle, first of all. So let me talk about that for a moment. When I, when I teach this in different places, whether it's a Bible college or a church or wherever it might be, I ask people, why is that? Why do you get them to write down their principle in a simple phrase, a sound bite, a story or an illustration? And most people will say to me, so they remember it better. And that's true. Or so they can own it. And that's also true. But we're missing the main reason. The main reason is so they can pass it on easily. Because disciples make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And in our discipleship, we need to make sure that we, we're constantly thinking, I'm not just developing you, I'm not just discipling you, I'm discipling you in a way that you can disciple other people. And that's so key. Now, the second part of this, of course, is to fill in the gaps in their understanding. So this is where you bring in the teaching that you've already prepared in advance. So, for instance, um, what I'm putting on the screen here are um, something like, I think, six different principles I've learned um, from what Jesus did in John 1 when he recruited the disciples, because the principles are the same. So, the principles of recruiting disciples and getting people to an event are, are pretty much the same principles. So, I already have these six principles. If the person I'm discipling has already discovered one of them, and now they've got a sound bite, I will say, that's great, I will affirm that, and I will say, that's fantastic, let me share five others with you. Or maybe they've come up with something that wasn't on my list, and I'll say, that's amazing, I hadn't even thought about that, that's great, fantastic, let me show it with you, my five. So this is where the 
teaching comes in. But now they can apply it better because they have an experience, they have context to put it into. And secondly, what's really good, of course, is they, they are probably more hungry to know how they can improve next time. So they're pulling that information from you. So then we go to step four, a little bit more to this one. Uh, this is a step that a lot of people don't think about. Step four, multiply it. So how do we now multiply what we've done in them so they can do it in other people? And I ask uh, three questions. First of all, how will you go the first mile and improve what you just did? So if we did this again, what would you do differently? Oh, well, next time I'll put more time and resources and energy into equipping people so they can share about their event with their friend and less money spent on posters and radio adverts that didn't really work. Wonderful, fantastic. How would you go the extra mile and train others in what we did? Oh, well, I'll take my youth group leaders and I'll do an event with them and I'll take them through the same template. Fantastic. So I train one person, but this person's now trained three, four, five, six, maybe more people. That's wonderful. And then finally, I'll ask them, how will you avoid the diverted mile so you don't miss the point? So my simple way of explaining uh, the, the diverted mile goes like this. It's something you're going to recognize, but maybe you've not thought of. So imagine I have some people coming to my house, um, and they're really important people. They're friends of mine, and I have three sons. And I say to my sons, okay, I've got, um, I've got about 12 uh, people coming, or nine people coming. I've got three tables for three people on each table. So son number one, I want you to put uh, plates and knives and forks um, on this table. Son number two, on the second table, do the same. Son, son number three, on the third table, please do the same. The first son goes the first mile. He sets out the table, puts the knives and the plates and the forks, everything out, wonderful. The second son thinks, well, I really love my dad, so I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to put out the knives and the forks and the plates, but I'm also going to go with my own money and buy a, a candle from a local store to, to have a nice little centerpiece for my dad's special guest. Goes the extra mile. The third son goes the diverted mile. He looks at those two sons and thinks, oh, I love the candle. I'm a very creative person. I like to do the creative kind of thing. Putting out the knives and the forks, and that's a bit boring. What I'm going to do is I'm going to paint a mural, a beautiful picture for my uh, father's guests. But he doesn't pour out the knives and the forks and the plates. So my guests come. I say to my first son, thanks for doing, thanks for being faithful and doing what I asked you to do. So my second son, I say, that's wonderful that you would go the extra mile and show your love for me that way. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And then to my third son, I go, I mean, the, the painting's nice, but you didn't do the very thing I asked you to do. Now, how many times have you seen people do that? You know, they, they take the bit they like and they go and do it. The bit that's more uncomfortable, they kind of ignore. So one of the questions I like to ask is, was Jesus a micromanager or a macromanager? You know, did Jesus micromanage disciples or did he macromanage them? Well, the answer is that Jesus micromanaged his disciples for three years in order that he could macromanage us for two millennia. The, the discipleship process in the second, second temple period was incredibly intense. Even now, Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Jewish rabbis will take their disciples into restrooms to show them how to wash their hands and how to use a lavatory. That intense. So Jesus was very intense. The Bible says he didn't just challenge them on what they did or didn't do. He even challenged them on the things they were thinking. There are verses where it says he knew what they were thinking and he challenged them and shaped their thinking even then. But then he was able to impart his Holy Spirit and not be around in, physical, in the physical sense. And the disciples changed the world. So we're getting ahead of the game here. Now, I know people who will um, delegate and think it's discipleship. So I'll give someone a job. You can do this, but we don't disciple them in the process. And then we spend forever fixing the problems. Much better to get ahead. So if you ask someone what would be your diverted mile, most people know well, knowing me, I'd probably want to do this, but not this. Okay, how do you avoid that? Okay, I'm going to avoid it by doing this. So you're getting ahead of the game, and it means you're going to grow them in a much quicker way. It's very intentional rather than just incidental, and that's key. So step one, 
experience it. Take people on an experience. Let's not just educate people and hope they go on an experience. Let's take them on an experience. That could be anything. The main key here is that there's some kind of example. You're showing them, not just telling them. Um, so you're showing them how to do it. You may not be perfect. You might have to do it together. You may make mistakes, but you're taking them with you. Then question it. Did it work? Didn't it work? Why didn't it work? Why did it work? What's the principle we can pass on to others? Because that principle will help us in this again, but it might help us in many other things. So that principle may help you to invite people to another youth event, but that same principle may help you recruit disciples or recruit people to many other things you might do in the rest of your ministry or the rest of your life. Understand it. What are the gaps? What are the principles? What are the other things we can learn here? And then finally, multiply it. I think it's really important that when you're discipling people, they know the end goal, the end goal is not simply they become more like Jesus. The end goal is that they do become more like Jesus and do what therefore Jesus did. You know, let me just finish uh, really by, by saying this. Christianity isn't simply about believing in Jesus. It's about believing what Jesus believed in. Christianity isn't simply about trusting in Jesus. It's about trusting in what Jesus trusts in. Christianity is about becoming like him. And of course, it all comes back to that question. Do we want to be Jesus' students or do we want to be his disciples? If we want to be his disciples, we will intentionally go and make disciples. But for our collaboration, we're going to download the document, discuss the questions, and disciple others in what we've learnt. Hi, we hope you enjoyed this episode of LiveWire. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, I'd like to recommend the book, Talmudim, How to Disciple Anyone in Anything.